In 11.3 and 11.4, um, we talked about two different vector operations, um, the dot product and the cross product, two different types of multiplication. And in the first lessons, 11.1 and 11.2, we kind of got oriented to three-dimensional space and we did some very basic shapes um, like the like extrusions, things that used to be our two-dimensional graphs, now being kind of clicked and dragged into three dimensions, and also the most basic type of planes. So in this lesson, what we want to do is we want to expand our knowledge again of things we can graph, some of the most basic things we can graph in three dimensions, lines and planes. And we'll start with lines, since that's kind of where we would use to start in like algebra one. <coughs> Excuse me. And so as a reminder, when we wrote the equation of a line in two dimensions, we needed two things. One, we needed some kind of point that we knew was on the line. And two, we needed some kind of slope. And that provided us our direction that we could then change and find a new point. Notice we, when you think about graphing in two dimensions, if you graphed a point and you know the slope was two, you went up two to the right one. But if you wanted other points because you were moving off the graph, it was also possible to move down two and to the left one until you were able to make a line. Okay, so using that slope as a direction, both forwards and backwards. Much like everything else we've seen thus far, when going into three dimensions, we want the, excuse me, when we're writing the equation of a line, we also want a point that we know to be on the line. And while we can't have a slope um, in the way that we used to think about it, dy dx is only the relationship between y and x. And now we have a relationship between more than those variables we still need some kind of direction. We need something to represent how we're going to change over time. And so we are going to use a direction vector showing us how to change in order to get to the next point on this line. There are a couple ways that we can write the equation of a line. And the first one is here. This is the vector equation of a line. We get a vector, okay, some kind of vector the tip of which is tracing out our line, okay? So think about the fact that my pencil, as it goes across the page, is the tip of the pencil is drawing a line, but the vector itself, my pencil itself, is not a part of the line, okay? The tip of the vector is kind of drawing it, okay? So we're kind of thinking about these, this vector as providing each of the coordinates, each of the end points of the vector, that we're going to graph. And these, these, sorry, let me erase this line here. Each of these elements represents something different. We've got our initial point. It doesn't necessarily have to be the initial point. Okay, lines are also infinite, so it's just a point that's on the line. We've got a parameter. And then we've got our V, our direction vector. And we like to think of the parameter usually as some kind of measure of time, um, but really it's just kind of asking us how many of the direction vectors would you like to add on, or would you like to go in the other direction? Would you like to make the parameter negative? Okay, this is important because when we write things in parametric form, we can define the change for each, oops, meant to highlight that, we can define the change for each component separately. They don't have to be related to each other. They could be, okay, and we could also solve them to, you know, have some kind of relationship, um, but they can each have their own change, start at all different locations, each have their own change component. Notice that the vector v is a, b, c, okay, um, and so we want to keep them all separate. Parametric equations allows us to do that because we can use a fourth parameter, time in this case maybe, to calculate the position of our graph um, without having to make the coordinates like solve for y equals some function of x. Okay. We also have parametric equations where we have them all separately, just a list. Notice that that's not really that different from what's written here. We've just written them as a list as opposed to in vector notation. 
Now, um, because there are field notes that accompany this video, I'm not gonna go through all the examples to make sure that we keep this short. So when we see an example, I'm just gonna give you the strategy for how we might do it. So in example, example one, they want us to find the vector equations and parametric equations for a line. Notice that we have a point, and it says that it's parallel to this vector. Well, that parallel vector, okay, notice that if this is our vector, and we want a line that is parallel to that, that vector can serve as the direction for our line. So you don't really have to do anything extra. They've given you the point that you needed, 1, 0, negative 3, and they've given you the direction vector. Okay, it doesn't have to be something specific. Okay, you could scale it however you would like, but it should provide these directions. And you can use here, you can use the vector equation or you could use the parametric equation. You could also, a reminder, use a different vector. Has to be the same direction, but it could be a different length. Maybe I wanna make a unit vector. Maybe that makes it easier. Um, or I could just scale it to be half the original size. So I could also use, I'll call this V1 and V2. I could also use one, negative two, five halves as a direction vector. Notice it's only providing the direction um, to get to another point on the line. And since there are infinite points on the line, it's okay to use different scale factors of the vector. We're always gonna multiply it by T. So we can, you know, having the, if I use this vector, the time it takes me to get to a certain point might be different than the time it takes me to get to the same point using this vector. Um, so the t's might be different depending on which equation I use, um, but they will all create the same points eventually. Okay. All right. Um, another definition here, if we've got a vector a, b, and c, whoop, a, b, and c, they describe the direction, that's that vector direction, they call themselves the direction numbers. That's not super important, but it is noteworthy that any three numbers proportional to A, B, and C could be used. That's what I'm talking about in terms of scaling it up or down. Now there's a third equation that we could use, okay? The symmetric equations of the line, that is this format. That looks weird. You're like, wow, you actually did make a relationship between X, Y, and Z. Yes, that's because I solved each of the equations we were using before. I solved each of these equations for time. And since we're solving all for the same time, they should all be set equal to each other. Okay, now quick note, if A, B, or C, if any of those direction numbers are zero, meaning that the line, um, we actually don't change from that X value, you know, maybe it's going through the plane X equals five or something like that, and we're not, we're not actually changing X, excuse me, then we don't divide by zero, okay? We just state that the variable that's not changing remains at the same number while the other two positions do change, okay? All right, so for this example, if we wanted to find a set of parametric, okay, so three separate equations, and symmetric, solving those for t and setting them equal to each other, Parametric and symmetric equations of the line that pass through these two points. So notice they did not give you a point and a vector, they give you two points. So first, you need to find the direction vector. But you can find that pretty easily by doing B minus A. Okay, what's the change in between A and B? Okay, so find the direction vector and then choose one of the points to write the equation of the line. Okay, it doesn't actually matter which point you choose, um, either way. Follow-up questions though, once we've got that equation, at what point does the line intersect the yz plane? So at what point does the line intersect the yz plane would be when x is equal to zero. So you can substitute that into one of your equations, okay, whichever format you like best. You could sub it into the parametric equation and solve for time. You could sub it into the symmetric equation and solve for y and z a little bit separately. Either way, you shouldn't end up with a point. 
Okay, so that would be part two. And then the question, is this line parallel to this other parametric equation, this other line? If it's going to be parallel, thinking about one line, second line, I think that used to be the symbol for parallel. Maybe it's just one. Oh, maybe it's the arrows. It's been a long time since geometry. If they're going to be parallel, then the direction vector that defines each of them should also be parallel. Okay, so check if the direction vectors are parallel. And the easiest way to do that would be to see if they're scalar multiples. You can also use a cross product, but that feels like a little bit too much work. Okay, check to see quickly if they're scalar multiples and then you can see if they're parallel. All right, one other definition that we might have heard of before is something called a skew line. A skew line does not, excuse me, skew lines, because it's a relationship, they do not intersect, but they are not parallel. Okay, so they don't lie in the same plane. They don't have the same direction vectors. Okay, so they don't intersect anywhere and they are not parallel, okay? So for these two examples, my recommendation is you need to check both parallel and intersecting um, so that you can then know if they're going to be skew. That's pretty much the only way to prove that they are skew is to prove that they are not parallel and then prove that they are not intersecting. So the first step would be to check if they're parallel. Okay, a quick glance at their direction numbers, two, one, four, one, two, three, tells me that they're not scalar multiples. So they are not going to be parallel. My second step would be to check for an intersection. And I am actually gonna call it a common point. Okay, because it's possible that they go through the same point, but it might not be at the same time parameter. So we wanna be careful about this, okay? So I would recommend when you're checking for a common point, use the parametric form. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and write, let me just write that out for one of them. So remember that the parametric form, if you need to go back from symmetric, each of these is equal to time. So time equals x minus one over two. So you could say that for L1, 2t plus 1 equals x. And for L2, x over 1 equals time. Okay, well that makes sense. t equals x. Excuse me. But I want to, and here's where I get confused. Do you see I use the same t in both? It might not be that the lines go through their common point at the same time. So to accommodate for that, I am actually going to use a different parameter for my second equation. Um, you can use whatever parameter you would like. I think in the field notes I used S. I don't recommend that. It looks a lot like five, <laughs> but here we are. Okay, and you would repeat for the Y coordinates and the Z coordinates. If they're going to intersect, then there should be a way for two T plus one to equal S and that would be the X coordinates should be the same. And similarly, if we went ahead and converted the Y coordinates, okay, the equation for Y is T equals negative two plus two S. Okay, you can see how we're kind of, we used to have three variables. Okay, and for Z, just for funsies, it's one plus four T should be equal to negative two plus three S. We've taken a system of equations that had three variables and we've narrowed it down to something, three equations, two unknowns, and that will allow us to solve, okay? Make sure to check your work. Once you get a time that they, that, once you get a solution, okay? Make sure that plugging in that time for L1 and that S for L2 give you the same coordinates to make sure they do intersect. These ones should intersect.
But if they didn't, if you got no solution to this little parametric system of equations we made, then you would know that they were skew. Okay. Summary here, three different definitions of lines. And by definitions, I mean three different ways to write it. All of them require that you have some kind of point already on the plane. Okay, we call that some initial condition maybe. And you use a direction vector to show the change. You can represent it as a vector equation, a set of parametric equations, or a set of symmetric equations. To know the two lines are parallel, their direction vectors should be parallel. To know the two lines are skew, they cannot be parallel, and they cannot intersect. And to check for an intersection, make, through the, make sure they find a common point, not necessarily at the same time. The other thing we wanted to talk about was planes. And the difference between a line and a plane, obviously, is that both of them have an infinite number of points, but a plane seems to have more points, right? A line representing some string or like laser beam through space. Okay, notice I didn't say curve. I'm, specifically, a line is very straight through space. Okay, a plane being kind of an infinite sheet of paper with zero thickness. The problem is a plane can contain an infinite amount of vectors and lines. So knowing that a point and a vector are in a plane is not necessarily as helpful as we think it is. For example, let me draw a quick, oop, did not mean to zoom out, sorry friends. Okay, here's a point. And here's a vector coming out of that point. It is possible that all of that is in this plane that I'm making here, okay, contained in this plane. But it is also possible that it's contained in the sideways plane, kind of going through the middle. So how do I define a plane if I can't use only the information that I have a point and a vector? Okay, a single vector, again, as I'm saying here, single vector parallel to the plane or even in the plane is not enough to give a direction because a plane contains, well, excuse me, the vector itself could be contained in an infinite number of planes. It's not specific to that one plane. But if I can find a vector that is perpendicular to the plane, then that's enough to give the quote direction of the plane. Because if I can find a vector that is perpendicular to this plane, let me pick a color here if I can, pick like green. If I can find a vector, let's say that is perpen, wow, that's a terrible color choice. I'm so sorry. How about red? Perpendicular. Okay, we got a little right angle here, right angle to the plane. Then it will be perpendicular to all of the other vectors in that plane as well. Okay, and it's not, here's the key, it is not going to be perpendicular to the vectors in another plane. It's going to be in another plane or parallel to another plane. It won't be perpendicular to any other plane. So the, um, the normal vector is what we're looking for. The normal vector will be enough to define our plane as something unique. Okay. I say that knowing that once you find, we just, we just talked about how you could use a variety of vectors um, to make a line. We could scale the vector that we used up or down. That's the same for this normal vector. We could scale it up or down, but it has to be a vector that is orthogonal to the plane, orthogonal, hmm, orthogonal. It sounds very much like the cross product, okay? But before we get ahead of ourselves and thinking about how to find this normal vector, every equation of a plane needs, again, a point that's in the plane and a vector orthogonal to the plane. Now, we find the vector equation of the plane by saying, hey, we're defining the plane by this normal vector. If I take the dot product of the normal vector and any vector that's in the plane, 
okay? Any vector that's in the plane. We'll start with like a point minus that initial point we were given. And I'm gonna represent those points with vectors. That way we can use our vector operations here. Okay, if that normal vector is in fact orthogonal to everything in the plane, and I just created a vector that's in the plane, this should be equal to zero. The dot product of two orthogonal vectors should be zero. Okay, and just to remind you what I just did, we're calling R not a known, uh, a known point in the plane is where I'm using, I'm cheating a little bit, I'm using my vector notation to represent, I'm using the tip of my vector as a point, okay? And we're saying, we're leaving this intentionally blank. We're saying that this is an unknown point in the plane. And the reason I want it to be an unknown point in the plane is when I'm writing an equation, we talked about this kind of on day one, when I'm writing an equation, I'm really trying to write a set of restrictions to say, how do I know a point is in this plane? If I give it a point, I should be able to plug it into the equation and make sure that it's true. So I'm intentionally leaving this R open so that I can check whether or not a, a given point would make this equation true. Okay, so this looks like if I kind of dot it out here, okay, I've given you some parameters down here. N is the vector ABC, R is the unknown XYZ, and R naught is the X naught, Y naught, Z naught. Okay, if I actually dot those two things together, A, B, C, dotted with X minus X naught, Y minus Y naught, Z minus Z naught, that dot product, if n is orthogonal, should be equal to zero. Okay, and reminder that the dot product is the sum of all, if each component multiplied together. And that's how you get this equation right here. A nice, beautiful equation. Okay, something that looks a little bit more normal. There is a more common form, a linear equation. I actually don't like that as much because it requires you, kind of like um, slope intercept, requires you to actually know the intercept. Um, this equation makes me feel like I have to know what D is right away, whereas the top equation, I just need to know the normal vector and a point in the plane. I don't really have to know what this is. I don't have to have like multiplied it all out. So I really like this one better. Okay. For example four, let's do a strategy. I do not expect you to graph the planes. So you can cross that out. They've given you three points in the plane. Um, you need one point and the normal vector. And to find a vector that is normal to the plane, we are going to take two vectors in the plane. Okay, we'll have to find that first. One, find two vectors in the plane. Okay, and then I'm going to cross them by crossing, doing the cross product of those two vectors, I will create naturally a vector that is normal to those two vectors. And if it's normal to those two vectors, it's going to be normal to all the other vectors that are also in this plane. Okay, so we're gonna cross two vectors to get n. Once we have n, we need to just choose one of our points. Doesn't even matter which one. Okay, and then we will plug it into the formula. Okay, no need to simplify. Using, again, using this formula will be sufficient. Okay, but this is a good place for our cross product to show up. Okay, it helps us figure something out. Okay, all right. In example five, Okay. If we want to find the equation of a plane that contains this line and is parallel to this other plane, then we need the same kind of steps. We still need a normal vector and we need a point. You can get a point from this line. You could either use the initial point that's already written or you could sub in a time t and find a point. 
Okay, so any point on this line will also be in the plane. Use it to find one of those points. And second, if two planes, let's say this is a plane, I'm looking at it from a side view. And here's another plane. Wow, those are supposed to be parallel. Okay, if two planes are parallel, then their normal vectors should also be parallel. And if, they're, if two vectors are parallel, that means that they're scalar multiples of each other. The easiest way to think about finding a normal vector for our plane is to say, hey, if our plane is parallel to the other plane, I can use the other plane's normal vector as my normal vector. That makes it super easy. And remember that normal vector is just the direction numbers, the coefficients of x, y, and z. Okay, so grab a point that's on the line, grab your normal vector, okay, and, excuse me, okay, and um, plug it in. So plug it into our formula. I was checking something, I was looking to my left, and I said, how can I check to make sure that's the right normal vector? Well, remember that if this is a normal vector, then it should be perpendicular to the direction values for our line. So you can take the dot product of your normal vector and the direction vector for your line, and it should be zero, just to check that they are in fact orthogonal. Okay. All right, um, right, two planes are parallel if their normal vectors are parallel. So that's a way to prove kind of vice versa. We can say that two planes are parallel if their normal vectors are parallel, okay? because normal vectors define the direction of the plane. Two planes are not parallel, they intersect in a straight line, and the angle between the two planes is defined as the acute angle between their normal vectors. So that might look like, here's plane number one, okay, here's plane number two, and I've got normal vector number one, normal vector number two. Okay, all right, so you can check this. Remember to find the angle between two vectors, you can use your dot product formula with the cosine that we talked about last class. The reason that this angle, theta, the acute one, theta, the reason that that works out is because when we create that plane intersection and the normal vector intersection, we actually created a quadrilateral. And the angles inside of a quadrilateral add up to 360 degrees. If I subtract off the 90 degree angles that are here and here, I'm left with 180 degrees. If you are doing the dot product with cosine formula and you end up finding that the angle between these two vectors is obtuse, you're not wrong, you just solved for this angle. We as mathematicians wanted the acute angle, so you can always do, if you accidentally get the other one, you can always do 180 degrees minus the obtuse angle to get the acute part. Okay, and the, it's even simpler if the, pay, if the planes are perpendicular because then their normal vectors will be perpendicular and the angle will be 90 degrees, and that's great. All right, I'm actually gonna move through these two examples pretty quickly. Um, are these two planes parallel? Check their normal vectors are parallel. Um, find the equation of the plane through this point and perpendicular to this vector. Well, if, it's, if the plane itself is perpendicular to this vector, this is the normal vector, okay? And then you can find the angle between the two planes by finding the angle in between their normal vectors, okay? Look back at your dot product formula. Okay, it makes sense. Two planes and normal vectors are parallel if the normal vectors are scalar multiples and the planes are perpendicular if the dot product of their normal vectors is zero. Okay, more examples about perpendicular. Perpendicular, okay, last thing. Distance between two planes. Now there's a separate video on how this formula came up because this formula is actually a component formula. Okay, it's actually the projection of a couple of things. Okay, but that will be a separate video um, that you can watch if you would like. This isn't exactly the distance formula, okay? But it is 
the distance from a point to a plane. So this formula, excuse me, here, okay, the point is x1, y1, z1. So it's like we plug that point that is not on the plane into this plane formula, okay? Kind of see what the actual difference would be. How far are we off? And then divide by the magnitude of the normal vector. Again, that feels like some kind of dark arts there, but if you watch the extra video about distance between two planes, you'll see that it actually comes from us projecting a vector onto the normal vector for the plane. Um, these are, because the numerator is going to result in a constant, those are absolute value lines. Um, distance is supposed to be a positive constant. Now, Obviously, one thing to notice would be if the point is in the plane, then plugging the point in here, here, and here, if it's in the plane, it will satisfy this equation and the distance will become zero. Okay. And this really only works if um, the planes are parallel, right? Because if we have two parallel planes, then we really, here's the diagram you're going to see in the other video. If I want the distance between this point and the plane over here. Okay, we don't exactly want to measure this magnitude. We would want to actually project it onto the normal vector. Okay, if the planes intersect, then the distance between the two planes varies, and so we would want to be really specific about why we are choosing a specific point when we could just choose the fact that the distance between them is zero at some points. So generally, you'll see this happening between two parallel planes. Okay, so for example 10, for example 11, it's really just plugging it into the formula. For example 10, though, you will need two things. Okay, number one, you will need one plane, so just choose one, it actually doesn't matter which one you choose, one plane and, wow, my writing is getting sloppy here as I get tired, and a point on the other plane, something that is super easy to kind of identify. So for example, one, exam one thing that I looked at was I was like, okay, I'm gonna use this one as my plane, and then on the other one, I'm gonna use the point one, zero, zero, because if I plug in one, zero, zero, I get one. And that was, that was just super easy to find as a point, so I'm gonna use that one. Okay, and then it becomes plugging into the formula. All right, so I'm gonna stop here, and we'll do some of these examples in class, um, but I wanna encourage you to take a look at my other videos um, if you have more questions about how did we get to some of these formulas. So I mentioned that there is one on the distance between the two planes. There's also one on um, how did the equation of a plane arise. Um, it's basically, um, in, this, in the other video, it's looking at the equation of a plane as the volume of a parallel pad, which we covered in 11.4, being zero. Okay, so basically checking, is that parallel pad flat? And if it is, that means all the points we used all the vertices were in the same plane. Okay, so you can take a look at that. All right, and then there's some other ones if you want to go back and touch up on some of the um, knowledge behind the dot product and the cross product, you can also find those.